see, I think I want to read today from uh, the Old Testament in uh, 1 Samuel chapter 17. And this is the uh, familiar story of uh, David and Goliath. And everybody knows this story, of course. Um, we tell it to our kids, and it's just part of the culture, really. It's a familiar story. But I think there's some interesting things we can observe um, as we uh, look at it. And so I'm just going to start reading in verse 1. Um, now the Philistines gathered together their armies to battle and were gathered together at Shoko, which belongs to Judah and pitched between Shoko and Azekah in Ephesdemim. Now I guess that would mean something to the people uh, there at the time. For us it's just a lot of strange names. But that's where they were. Uh, and Saul and the men of Israel were gathered together and pitched by the valley of Elah and set the battle in array against the Philistines. Now here's the um, people of God on one side and the enemies of the people of God on the other side, the Philistines, and they're pitched for battle. And uh, that's the, they're against each other, they're opposed. And so there's this conflict, you see, between the two sides. People of God on one side and the enemies of God, enemies of the people of God at least, on the other side. And um, verse 3, the Philistines stood on a mountain on one side, and Israel stood on a mountain on the other side, and there was a valley between them. And there went out a champion out of the camp of the Philistines named Goliath of Gath, whose height was six cubits in a span. And he had a helmet of brass on his head, and he was armed with a coat of mail, and the weight of his coat was 5,000 shekels of brass. And he had greaves of brass upon his legs and a target of brass between his shoulders. And the staff of his spear was like a weaver's beam and his spears had weighed 600 shekels of iron and one bearing shield went before him. And he stood and cried unto the armies of Israel and said unto them, why are you come out to set your battle in array? Am, I not, am not I a Philistine and you servants of Saul? Choose you a man for you and let him come down to me and if he be able to fight with me and kill me then we will be your servants but if I prevail against him and kill him then you shall be our servants and serve us and the Philistines said I defy the armies of Israel this day give me a man that we may fight together now in this little setup here you see that uh, the way the rules of this battle are uh, announced here by the this giant here comes this giant out of the Philistines what he says is, let's, he doesn't say, let's all, all of us, all of our armies fight. He says, send a man. He says, I'm going to come out as an individual. So it's like one man against one man, in other words. Now, uh, as we read this story, of course, we know the story. Uh, I'm not telling you, I hope I'm not telling you a story that, you know, you've never heard before. And you're not, I hope you're not sitting there wondering what's going to happen. <laughs> but let me just step back from the story for a minute and say, now, why, why do we read stories like this? Or why should we read them? Or what's the point? Or what do we hope to gain from looking at a story like this? Um, well, you know what? It depends on what you think, how you think about Christianity and how you think about Jesus. Um, you see, uh, when Jesus uh, came to his disciples uh, on a certain occasion, he said to them, uh, Whom do men say that I am? You've heard that story, of course. Uh, Jesus asked them, what, what's everybody saying about me? And that's basically what he's saying. Who do men say that I am? In other words, what's the consensus about Jesus? And they all began to tell him what they'd heard, what other people were saying. And you know, I, I think uh, a lot of Christians, that's kind of where they are. Their attitude about Jesus is, uh, I don't want to, you know, I, I just want to stay with the consensus of what is the what everybody is saying and thinking. And uh, what... Uh, what most people think about Jesus, oh, finally he said to Peter then, who do you say that I am? So he, he made it individual. First he said, who does everybody else say that I am? But the real issue is, who do you say that I am? You know, what's your attitude about it? Who is he, in, as far as you're concerned? And, and you can find a lot of different uh, ideas about, see, it boils down to uh, how you view Jesus, how you view Christ, uh, determines what you think Christianity is all about. A lot of people see Jesus as a, uh, well, some people, there's whole branches of Christianity that see Jesus as just another lawgiver, like Moses, who comes to reiterate the Old Testament law and just to reinforce it. 
And there are people who see him as a great teacher, who gives great teaching, and, you know, so we can follow his teaching. And then there's others who say, well, Jesus, he's a good example to follow. And I don't fault any of those. He is a good example. The problem with the example of Jesus is he's a perfect example. You know? And unless you're going to be perfect, unless you can be perfect, uh, then following a perfect example is not going to really help you uh, where God is concerned, unless you can also be perfect. But you see, um, Jesus, if you, what all those three views of Jesus as a lawgiver or a teacher or a good example, what they all have in common is what it boils down to is you doing something. You see, if he's a lawgiver, if he's a teacher, if he is a, uh, a good example to follow uh, as you see him, then what you think Christianity is, it's all about you performing. In other words, I've got to follow his teaching, then I perform. And it's all the burden is then on me. See, and I think, I, I don't know, I've never taken a survey, so I can't say a majority. But I, in talking to people, I find that a lot of people think that's what Christianity is. It's some kind of a, a, a self-help program or something. We're trying to better our lives in relation to God, trying to be good enough. And I've told, you know, I've mentioned this many times before about this woman I went to pray with, and she, she uh, you know, was at the end of her life, and, and uh, she, uh, she said, I just hope I've done enough good things so that I can make it in. You know, and that was really telling to me, because I'd ask her, are you a Christian? I didn't know this lady. I said, are you a Christian? She said, oh, well, I've been in church all my life. Of course, that was not what I asked her. <laughs> you know, I asked her, are you a Christian? You can be in church and not be a Christian, of course, you know. Uh, but uh, she said, I've been in church all my life. Then she added, I hope I've done enough good things so that I can make it in. So that tells me that from her point of view, Jesus is a person telling you the good things you're supposed to do. But you see, he's, he's primarily not that. Primarily, what Jesus came to be is a savior. You see, when Peter was asked, when Jesus said to Peter, who do you say that I am? Peter said, you're the Christ. Now, for an Israelite like Peter, uh, Christ was the coming Messiah, the Savior of Israel. And on the night when he was born, of course, as you know, uh, from the Christmas story, if you've ever watched the Charlie Brown Christmas special, if, we, if we've learned one thing from the Charlie Brown Christmas special, it's, <laughs> it's that Christmas story. Uh, and and how, what it said, the angels on the night that he was born told the shepherds that were watching their flocks by night, unto you this day is born in the city of David a Savior. I like that word, Savior. You see, and there's, I, I'm not diminishing his teaching. and I'm not, He did lots of things. I'm not diminishing anything that Jesus did. His teaching is wonderful. His healings are marvelous. And, uh, and, and all those things, he's a prophet. And he is a good example. You know, all those things are true, but primarily, what the, when he was born, the angel said, for you, unto you, that means for you. For you is born this day a Savior. And so, he came for you as a Savior. Now, what that tells me then is, see, a Savior is a person who does it for you. If you could save yourself, then you don't need a Savior. In other words, if Christianity is about something you do, then you don't need a Savior. It excludes you doing it. It's either him or you. It's not cooperative. It's not both as far as uh, our relationship with God is concerned. Christianity is not about what you do for God. It's about what God has already done for you. It's not about you performing. It's about Jesus performing. It's not about how good you can be. It's about how good he already is. It's all about him. That's why it's called Christianity. It's got his name on it. It doesn't have your name on it, does it? It's got his name on it. So when we read um, a story like this in this Old Testament story, and I'm going to go ahead and read a little more here in a minute, but I just want to uh, call your attention to the fact that, you see, when, when we read the Old Testament stories, what generally happens is in one part of our mind, we're reading it and we're thinking, now how can I apply this to my life? Like it, as, seeing it as an example. Now, what many people do when they read a story like the story of David and Goliath is, they think to themselves, Goliath, he is, he's like the problems that I face, you know. And so now I'm going to get some good advice on how I can face my problems. But when you read about this giant here, it's pretty intimidating. <laughs> did, you, did you read that description of him? I, you know, if that's the way I'm going to read this story, if I'm going to read this and I'm going to put myself in the place of David, and, you know, spoiler alert, you know, <laughs> David's going to defeat the giant, in case you didn't know that already. 
and I hope I'm looking around to see if there's any shocked faces. As you know, uh, by the way, and I, I know you know because I tell it all the time, but on Sunday nights I go out here to BJCC and we have a prison service out there. And many times, most of the, those guys that come there, I guess, I suppose, many of them anyway, uh, have been in church, have been raised in church and got into trouble, you know. And I don't, I'm not finding fault with them one way or the other, but a lot of them have never been in church before and they're coming to, uh, you know, Christianity for the first time. And sometimes when I'm referring to a familiar story like this, I remember one time talking about Noah, Noah's Ark, and, and I'm, I'm telling, you know, the story, and, and I got distracted telling something else, and one of them says, well, then what happened? <laughs> well, I just thought everybody knew what happened. <laughs> you know, he didn't know. He was, he was on the edge of his seat, you know, pins and needles, wanting to know what the outcome is. But, uh, see, if you're going to imagine that you're in the place of David, and you're going to see the giant is this giant in the story is the devil maybe or your problems or whatever it is then you that's going to be a little bit frightening but here's what I want to suggest to you this story here is not about you fighting the devil it's not about you fighting your problems it's not about you confronting anything you know what it's about it's about Jesus confronting something for you now you notice the setup of this story the giant well, let's just talk about him for just a second did you know some of the details as I was reading? You might have missed these as I was reading. Back in verse uh, 4, Alex, um, I think this is kind of interesting. By the way, uh, oh, let's read it. Uh, and there went out a champion out of the camp of the Philistines, whose name was Goliath of Gath. And his height was six cubits and a span. And uh, then the next uh, uh, verse, let's see. Uh, oh, where was that one? Uh, oh, yeah, in verse 7. His staff of his spear was like a weaver's beam, and his spear weighed 600 shekels of, uh, uh, of iron. You notice how often the word six comes up, the number six comes up in description of this guy? Now, let me suggest something to you. I know that, and you know this too, that these books in the Bible, the Bible's made up of, what, 66 different books. They're all written by different people, not all, but some are written by the same author, but different individual human beings wrote these, but we, uh, we assume and uh, we take it, you know, as an article of faith that there is a guiding inspiration behind the writers. In other words, that these aren't just writers um, writing from, from a human perspective. And if they were, you wouldn't expect to find a, a, any kind of commonality or any kind of common thread. But because we believe in the inspiration of God guiding the, the minds and the hands of the people who write this, it's not uh, outside of the bounds of, uh, you know, reason to imagine that there might be some underlying meanings in the, in the text for us. And I noticed as I was reading this about the giants, uh, how often the word, uh, the number six comes up. And not only that, but um, if you go and reading in 2 Samuel, uh, Alex, if you'd turn for just a minute to 2 Samuel chapter 21 and uh, verse 18, you find out uh, as you go on in the story that uh, this giant uh, is part of a family of, uh, of giants. And here as the story um, goes on later, what did I say? Second Samuel 21, and I'm going to turn here and read it to verse 18. We find out that the, uh, the rest of them have to be dealt with as well. But I want you to notice some of the description about these, these other, these brothers and offspring of this giant. Verse 18 in Second Samuel 21. And it came to pass after this that there was again a battle with the Philistines at Gob. I love these names. These are great names. Wish we had a town around here named that. That's a funny name, isn't it? And uh, Sibachai the uh, Hushethite and slew Saph, which was of the sons of the giant. Am I in the wrong verse? Yeah, okay. The giant. And verse 19 says, and there was again a battle in, in Gob with the Philistines, and uh, Elhanan, the son of guy with starts with the letter J, uh, a, a Bethlehemite, slew the brother of Goliath. So now we find out that Goliath had a brother, the Gittite, and the staff of whose spear was like a weaver's beam, uh, just like Goliath, verse 20. Now notice this. And there was yet a battle in Gath. That's where they're from, see, Goliath. They all, they all come from this place called Gath. And uh, where was a man of great stature that had on every hand six fingers and every foot six toes, four and twenty in number, and he also was born of the giant. 
Now we can go back to the story in chapter 17 of 1 Samuel. Did you notice six fingers, six toes, you know, everything's got a six. He's got six written all over him. Now if that uh, kind of rings a bell with you, if you've read other places in the Bible, you know that uh, six is a number. Well, what is six associated with if we want to say it's got associations? Well, first of all, uh, it's the number of the, uh, it's the day when man was created in, in the book of Genesis. On the sixth day, God made man. So it's got um, uh, an association with man. Uh, if you go clear to the end of the Bible, the book of Revelation, he talks about, uh, the, the author talks about some, uh, an entity or a personage, call, he calls him a beast. And he's got a number, 603 score and six. Six is all over the place. Well, however you want to interpret it, it's got uh, something that's not godly about it. And here this giant is definitely an enemy of God. And what I'm going to suggest to you is um, this six has the number of fallen man uh, associated with it. it. Has the number of the flesh. You know, a lot of Christians think that their battle is, some Christians think they're battling with the devil. And, uh, and some Christians think they're battling with the flesh. And what I want to tell you is that either way, Jesus is the one who overcame and defeated both those things. And as Christians, the way we're supposed to see it is not that we're in a battle, but we're in a victory. And that's what we're going to find out here, I hope, in a minute. I remember one time um, uh, going to this, um, this Promise Keepers meeting. And, of course, Promise Keepers, you know, I don't know if they even still have it or not, but for a while it was a really big deal. And, uh, and it's just, you know, men from all different kinds of churches and all different kinds of church traditions. And I remember this one particular guy came in one time. And, you know, and I'm not necessarily saying this to fault him or to make fun of him, even though kind of in a way I am. But... <laughs> but I, I was just cheerful, my regular cheerful self, and I said, hello, how are you doing? And he gave out this kind of a moan, you know, and I, and I know that in some church traditions that's, that's a kind of an expression of, you know, that's kind of how they have church. You know, he went, oh, like that, with his waver, oh, it sounded, to me it sounds spooky, you know. And he said, oh, I, said, I just said, how are you doing, you know. <laughs> And he said, oh, it's hard, he said. It's hard. And I said, I, I'm just waiting for him to explain, because you know, I didn't know what he's talking about. He said, oh, it's hard fighting this old flesh. <laughs> or no, what he said, Cru trying to crucify this old flesh. <laughs> he said it like that. And, and I thought to myself, well, yeah, it's hard. <laughs> you know, it's so hard that you're never going to get it done. <laughs> if that's your attitude, you're going to be moaning like that your whole life, because... Uh, you know, if it were a job for you to do, then we wouldn't have a Savior. We wouldn't be here talking about a Savior. Does that make sense? In other words, if you could do it, if you could make yourself acceptable with God, then you don't need Jesus. And that's just the bottom line about it. And you see, the reason Jesus was crucified in the flesh is so that you could get from Him the benefit of a victory over that. Uh, let's see, I don't know if I have that with me or not. Sometimes I read this news story I've got about a guy who, who literally thought, he took it all very literal. He evidently went to church and, and heard him talk about, you need to crucify the flesh, and he that was mentally disturbed, and he went home and tried to actually do that. And he nailed some two-befores together and took some big nails. And in this news story, he said that he called 911, and the reason he called 911 is he had nailed one of his hands to this board, and they didn't know if he wanted help with the wound or help nailing the other hand down. <laughs> because he found out that he could nail one hand down, but the other one's still loose. And so he, you know, I thought that was a, and I printed it off and got, I have it right here. Sometimes I even pull it out and read it. I thought that was a priceless story because that tells you that even if you think you're going to do it, even if you try to literally, you can't do it. You cannot do it. You cannot crucify yourself because you're always going to have one hand free, you see. And if you think that your job as a Christian is to crucify the flesh, think again. <laughs> you're going to find your whole life that you... You're, you're going to say, well, I'll try again next time. I'll try again. No, it's not about trying. It's not about any, It's about Jesus. It's, this Christianity thing is all about him winning a victory. So in this story, now, now that's the, I've given you the punchline ahead of time. So let's go ahead and get the details. I think there's some interesting things about this. Skip over. Now what happens is David shows up. See, all the Philistines are on one side. Then Goliath comes out and defies the armies of God and, and, uh, and they're all sitting there, and you read in the text, they're trembling and they're afraid, and the Israelites are. And, and rightly so. They know, and this is a good you know, lesson for us, they know they can't face this guy. You know, they haven't got what it takes. And that's a, you know, I think that's a great day for you as a Christian when you realize you haven't got what it takes. See, I think that's important. That's an important point that Christians sometimes have to come to, and I hope that everybody does. 
to the realization that you can't do it. Because it's only then that you're able to really fully trust Jesus to do everything. And it's really all about Him. And if you see your life, if you look at your life and you see that there's changes that need to be made, and corrections that need to be made, what it's about is not you doing it. It's about you trusting Jesus to do it. And, and He's able to do it better than you can, I guarantee you. You see, so they're, all the Israelites are trembling and afraid. They're scared of this guy, and rightly so. They know they can't face him. And so David shows up. Now, who is David? Well, um, you know, you've read about the story of David, so I'm not going to turn back and read it, but, you know, he's the son of a man named Jesse. And Jesse had lots of sons. And David, is, he, he's the last one. And he had lots of older siblings, David did. And uh, the prophet Samuel... God spoke to him, and he said, I want you to go to Jesse's house and anoint for me a king over Israel. Now, there's not going to be an election, and they're not going to vote for a king. God chose, you see. And God said, Samuel, I want you to go and anoint for me the king over Israel, God's choice. And the anointing means he's going to pour some oil, uh, and that's symbolic of the Holy Spirit. God's going to choose, and he's going to anoint, uh, choose for himself a king. Now, this should remind you of Jesus. Does that not remind you of, you know, ideas we have? Jesus is the ultimate uh, uh, manifestation of that. And so David is symbolic of it. Anyway, Samuel goes to, Dave, uh, to Jesse's house, and he says, God sent me here to anoint uh, somebody, and uh, so uh, you got any sons? And he see, the thing is, God didn't tell him who it was. And so Jesse says, oh, yeah, he brings out the oldest son. And Samuel says, nope, that's not him. And brings out the next one. Samuel says, nope, that's not him. Brings out the next one. Nope, that's not him. And brings them all out. Nope, that's not him. And so Samuel's kind of puzzled. Or, I don't know, none of these are him. You got any more? <laughs> and, and listen, this is how lowly, this is how little David was regarded in the eyes of his father. Oh, well, there's David. <laughs> you know, didn't even think to call him in. He's out there in the field keeping the sheep. He didn't even bother to bring him in. He was not regarded highly in, in terms of man. You see, that's exactly the language we read about Jesus, despised of men. Uh, when we see him, there's nothing about him that we should desire him. That's what uh, Isaiah prophesied about him. But when he brought David in, uh, the Lord spoke to Samuel and said, this is him, anoint him. So he was anointed of God, chosen of God. So he has this, he's carrying with him this anointing of the Holy Spirit. And so we, and he's like a type, uh, you know, a prefiguring of Jesus. So he shows up. And David comes to bring food to his brothers. David's not even in the army. <laughs> He's home keeping the sheep, and the brothers, they're in Saul's army. And so David shows up, and he hears all this talk. And then here's what happens in uh, verse 23. And as he, this is 23, did I say that? Yeah. Uh, Alex, we're in chapter 17, verse 23. And as he talked with them, behold, there came up the champion, the Philistine of Gath, Goliath by name out of the armies of the Philistines, and spake according to the same words, same thing we just read earlier. And David heard them, and all the men of Israel, when they saw the man, they fled from him, and they were sore afraid. And the men of Israel said, Have you seen this man that has come up? Surely to defy Israel he came up. He, he has come up. Uh, and it shall be that the man that killeth him, the king will enrich him with great riches, and will give him his daughter and make his father's house free in Israel. Now, uh, and as you know, you, we know the story. David says, well, now, now tell that to me again. <laughs> Let me hear that again, you know. And so David's getting in his mind he's going to fight the giant. But as I was reading this uh, yesterday, these, you know, usually you just read over this and it just sounds like, you know, he's going to give him everything. But, you know, I, I just, I stopped for a minute on this little phrase here. Um, what will happen to the man that kills him? Well, he'll make his father's house free in Israel. And I stopped on and pondered on that for a minute. I uh, wonder what that means, you know. So I looked it up, and uh, here's the first thing I found. Um, this is from Albert Barnes' notes on the Bible. And he, uh, this Albert Barnes, evidently a biblical expert, he says, what this phrase, his father's house free in Israel, means that uh, it means that you will be free as opposed to being a slave. No more a slave, now you're free. And I like that because that reminds me of what Jesus said when he said uh, to those that believed in him, he said, if you continue in my word, then you will know the truth. And when you hear the truth, the truth will make you free. So yeah, that's, that's pretty good. I like that connection. 
But uh, as I looked a little deeper, I found some other things. Look at what, uh, Alex, could you give me the Amplified on this verse? Verse 25? No, no. Yeah, 25, right. And the Israelites said, Have you seen this man who has come out? Surely he has come out to defy Israel. And the man who kills him, the king will enrich him with great riches and will give him his daughter and make his father's house free, free from taxes and service. How about that? In other words, don't have to pay anything, don't have to do anything. Now, again, we're saying David is like a type of Christ. And, uh, and if you read about Christ, you know, he's described as a as a bridegroom in the church, that's us. We're described as, as the bride of Christ in a sense. So this, you know, that kind of fits in. But the benefit, the benefit of the one who wins this battle is those that are his, what does it say again? Free from taxes and free from service. Now just in a common, ordinary human sense, that sounds pretty good right there. But think about it in a spiritual sense. That means you don't have to do anything. You don't have to don't have to do anything, don't have to pay anything. Did you know that is a perfect description of our relationship to God because of Jesus, because of what he's done. We are in a standing with God where we don't have to do it, we don't have to pay for anything, we don't have to earn anything, and we don't have to, uh, yeah, yeah, all those things. Don't have to do anything, don't have to pay, don't have to earn it. Um, I like also what the message said. I think it kind of gets to the bottom line. I like the message translation. Message says, the talk among the troops was, <laughs> have you ever seen anything like this? This man openly and defiantly challenging Israel. The man who kills the giant will have it made. The king will give him a huge reward and offer his daughter as a bride and give his entire family a free ride. Now, I like that. You see, to me, that gets, that gets right down to the, the bottom line of this. Did you know, and you might not have thought of this, you see, it depends on how you think about Christianity. If you think Christianity is something you've got to do and you've got to earn, then none of this will make any sense. But if you could understand that Jesus has already done everything that needs to be done, and he's already earned everything that needs to be earned, and because you are, you're a Christian solely because you put your faith in Christ, in Jesus, and because you have now you in relation to God, you've got a free ride. <laughs> is that okay? I hope that's not too bold for you. But I just like it that way. <laughs> And uh, if that's controversial, if that rubs somebody's fur the wrong way, well, I'm just going to say it again then. You've got a free ride. That reminds me of something, by the way, in Ephesians. I'm going to come back to this again. But Alex, could you give me, uh, and stay with the message on this. It's Ephesians chapter 1, verse, uh, where is that? Verse 13. This is something Paul said, and I like what the message says here. Now, this is writing in the New Testament. This is the Apostle Paul writing, and I'm just going to save time and go right to the message because I like the wording here. It's in Christ that you, once you heard the truth and believed it, this message of your salvation, found yourselves home free, signed, sealed, and delivered by the Holy Spirit. How about that? Is that like confirmation? Yeah. Uh, you see, Jesus is the one who did the fighting. Jesus is the one who won the victory. But how is our standing with God? Well, our standing is we got all the benefits of what He earned. We've got all the benefits of what He did. And specifically what that means is... Uh, Let's see, found yourselves home free. Now, I think that's a refreshing thought. Because I didn't always know that, by the way, as a Christian. I never really heard that in church. And it uh, took me a long time and a lot of reading to find these things. And I thought to myself, why didn't anybody ever tell me this? <laughs> Did you know, by the way, this is getting off the subject. I, I was telling you about the prison, at, you know, BJCC. Just last week, this is a fresh story. Just, <laughs> I've let a lot of old tired stories. <laughs> this, I, this just happened last week. You, if you remember, if you were here, um, in, if you were here last Sunday, what we talked about last Sunday here was uh, I, I found all the scriptures where it says that because you're in Christ, you're not condemned, and those who believe cannot be condemned, and those who believe will never be condemned. And Jesus said, if you believe in me, then you've already passed from death to life. You'll never come into judgment. And then we read the story about the woman who was taken in the act of adultery and she was clearly guilty. And Jesus said the one who's without sin cast the first stone. Nobody did. And so uh, he could have condemned her, but he didn't. And I just made that point that he could have condemned her, but he didn't. And if you're a Christian, you're not condemned and you never will be condemned, even though you are guilty of, you know, we've all done things wrong. God's not in the condemning business. And I read all those verses that had to say that. And after it was over with, uh, 
this young man came up and they all seemed pretty young to me. <laughs> they all seemed like, they just seemed like little teenagers really, a lot of them. And I feel kind of, you know, sympathetic for them. Um, and I know they've done wrong and they've gotten in trouble, but uh, nevertheless, you know, uh, I went out there and gave them the same message, you see. And one of these guys came up afterwards and he said, uh, he said, you know, I grew up in church and, and I, I said, I never heard any of those verses before. He said, I never heard, I never heard that I wasn't condemned. I thought I was. See, he's sitting there because he's, you know, and I, you know, if you're sitting in prison, you, you've got condemnation, you're coming at you from all angles, you know. Uh, but he said, I, I've never heard that in church before. I didn't even know any of that was in the Bible. And, uh, and I thought to myself after, after I left, I was pondering that and thinking, you know, something's wrong somewhere. <laughs> something's wrong. Uh, why would anybody hide that information? Why would you not want to just proclaim it, you know, and let everybody know that you're not condemned? You need to know it, by the way. You need to know if you're going to have, uh, if you're going to have an open and a close relationship with God, you've got to know that He's on your side and He's not against you and He's not finding fault and He's never going to condemn you. So I like this idea of what we're reading here. Once you believed it and enter in, see, when you put your faith in the Savior, you come under the, uh, um, uh, the, the, the caretaking influence. That's not a good word, but you come under His uh, protection. You see, He's your Lord. You know, that word Lord, by the way, goes back to the Middle Ages where they had the guy that the, has the castle, you know, and he's the king and, and all the serfs, you know, and he's, he's the Lord. Well, he... Uh, not only do they serve him, but he protects all of them. He, they're under his care. And you've come under the care of Jesus, you see. And he's taking care of you. He's looking out for you. Uh, he's not out to judge you or condemn you at all. Uh, Sign, sealed, delivered. Okay, let's finish this story of David, uh, David and Goliath. Um, Alex, uh, go back to uh, uh, 1 Samuel chapter 17. Let's just wrap it up here. Verse 45. And I'm going to go back to the King James now. Let's just finish this story off here. I like this. This is really good. Now see, when we read this, generally what we do is we put ourselves in the place of David. Think about Jesus. This is, this is Jesus confronting the devil, confronting the flesh, confronting everything that is the enemy of, of God, enemy of the people of God. Then David said to the Philistine, Thou comest to me with a sword and with a spear and with a shield, but I come to you in the name of the Lord of hosts, the God of the armies of Israel, whom thou hast defied. This day will the Lord deliver thee into mine hand, and I will smite thee and take thine head from thee, and I will give the carcasses of the host of the Philistines this day unto the fowls of the air and to the wild beast of the earth, uh, that all the earth may know there is a God in Israel. Boy, it sounds like this David, he's got some big time confidence in God. Do you know, as he says, I'm not only going to kill you, I'm going to kill all, the, all those Philistines too. And all this assembly shall know that the Lord saveth not with sword and spear, for the battle is the Lord's. By the way, that's something we need to know too. It's not your battle, it's his battle. The ba and even David here is saying, I I'm coming against you, but uh, it's not my battle, it's the Lord's battle. And you're going to find out the Lord knows how to fight a battle here. Um, and, it shall come, and it came to pass when the Philistine arose and came and drew near to meet David. David hasted and ran toward the army to meet the Philistine. And David put his hand in his bag and, and took thence a stone, and he slang it. Didn't know that was a word, by the way. <laughs> Don't use that in any of your formal papers at school. <laughs> and slang it. I guess if you do, you can say, well, it's in the Bible. <laughs> and smote the Philistine in his forehead, and the stone, <laughs> that the stone sunk into his forehead, and he fell upon his face to the earth. And David prevailed over the Philistine with a sling and with a stone. And he smote the Philistine and slew him. And there was no sword in the hand of David. He didn't even have weapons. He just had his little slingshot, you know, and his rocks. And, but the Lord gave him the victory, you see. It was God's battle. Therefore David ran and he stood upon the Philistine. I, you know, you might think to yourself, well, where's all these other people? I'm sure they're just standing there with their mouths hanging open. Like, what? <laughs> You know, nobody's moved. You know, like, I can't believe what I just saw here. And David ran and stood upon the Philistine and took his sword and drew it out of the sheath thereof and slew him and cut off the head therewith. And the Philistines saw their champion was dead and they fled. Well, it's a great victory. And this David, who I'm saying is a type of Christ, he won the victory all by himself. Now, you know, the, the enemy here, this giant, his name was Goliath of Gath. And... Um, the tradition of uh, 
Jewish tradition is. And of course, we know from the Bible that David eventually becomes the actual king of Israel. And he goes and establishes his throne in Mount Zion in, uh, in, in Jerusalem. And Jewish tradition says that, of course, he won this great victory and he kept that sword. Now that comes up in the Bible again where he stored the sword. But the tradition says that he kept the head too and he took the head back with him as a trophy back to Jerusalem. And eventually he buried that head on a hilltop and that became a traditional thing because it was a great victory. And the hill where the, the head of Goliath was buried uh, bore that name. And it came to be called, you remember what his name is? Goliath of Gath. And over the centuries, it came to be called Golgotha because it was the place where Goliath of Gath, Golgotha, was buried. It was the hill um, under which David buried the trophy of this victory over the enemies of God. And, you know, I was about to say just by coincidence, but, you know, I tend to think things that are in the Bible and things that happen that we read about, there's no coincidences. Just like I told you the fact that this guy had six all over him. That's not a coincidence. And the fact that David buried the head of Goliath of Gath on a hill that came to be called Golgotha. And, of course, you know what happened there. That's where Jesus uh, went to the cross. And in an ironic way, you know, this is a very, we can understand a victory where you take out a slingshot and hit the giant in the head. But you see, where the real victory was won over our enemy, whether you consider it the flesh or the devil, either way, where the real victory was won was on that place, Golgotha, where Jesus on the cross took away all of our sins, took away everything that ever separated us from God and won for us a victory that we could never have gotten for ourselves. And because of that, just like uh, we read here in the text, uh, what's going to happen for the family of the people who, uh, for whom this victory is accomplished? Well, they're going to be free in Israel. No taxes, no service, nothing to pay, nothing to do, signed, sealed, delivered. And that's where we find ourselves. And for only one reason, because we put our faith in the one that won that victory for us. Okay, let's all stand up today.